All right. I want to thank you all for being here. I am very passionate about wildlife rehabilitation. I, I live for it. I eat it, I sleep it, and the fact that you are here interested in that warms my heart. Hopefully, in a year from now, some of you will become wildlife rehabilitators. That's what I am hoping. And maybe a year from now, some of you won't be that we're heading on into it after deciding it was not right for you. We had a girl who was volunteering with us. She, straight A student, she uh, was in her fourth year of college. She needed a little bit of experience and she was heading to vet school. That's what she wanted to be her whole life. She worked for us for a year. She's graduating from college, got accepted into University of Pennsylvania, one of the top vet schools in the country. And she was ready to start there. And she came to me and she said, I've got a real problem. I said, what? She goes, I hate it. She said, I, I love the animals. She said, I can't stand the blood and guts. I can't stand the gore. I'm going to hate being a veterinarian. And my parents have got so much invested in my college right now. How in the world do I go? And I tell them. And I said, well, first of all, it's not their life. It's your life. You have to do what's, hap what's happy for you. You go to them and you find another avenue. She goes, but I learned something else while I was here at Red Creek. She said, you took me to schools and we took the birds and we were teaching kids about wildlife. I fell in love with that. She went to her parents, told them. When they found out that they only had to pay for a, one more semester for her to get her teaching license, <laughs> they were tickle pink. Instead of her another four years of veterinary college, she is now the biology teacher at Maho Mahanoy City High School. And she learned what she loved by doing it. And that's what I want to do today. I want to take you on a back door inside a rehab center kind of thing. So you can make up your mind. Um, this, this, I don't know what you'd call it, a course, a class, a seminar, whatever, this talk is not note intensive. The first half of it is really you just soul searching. The second half of it, where we really get into the technical stuff of the regulations and the applications, we've got handouts for you. They're online. You can download them. You don't have to write down anything except the website, and I'll give you that later when it comes up. So let's get started. I first became a wildlife rehabilitator in 1991, and when I got licensed, I was licensed number 30. There were, at that time, 28 wildlife rehabilitators. So two people had quit. There are now about 120 permit numbers out there today 31 wildlife rehabilitators, two of them aren't active. That means over 70 people started and quit. A lot of wildlife rehabilitators quit within the first two or three years of opening, and there's reasons for it. The very first reason is the cost. Wildlife rehabilitation is unfunded. There is no state, there is no federal funding at all. You will not get paid to do this. If you make it into a career, you do that yourself. It can be done if you do it intelligently. You have to think of it as a lifestyle and as a business. Another reason is stress and burnout. This past 12 months, we've taken in 1,400 animals. About 13% of the phone calls that we get result in an animal coming in. That means 87% of the phone calls we get end up with us re-educating someone into putting an animal back. Do you know how many times my phone rings? Wildlife rehabilitation can be very stressful. You take in an animal, and I don't care how much you try to keep your distance from it, you have an emotional investment, all of a sudden it dies. One morning you wake up and it's laying there dead. That's stress, and a lot of people can't handle it and they burn out. Family can burn you out. If you have a spouse who's like, I don't know why you want to do this, you might want to rethink rehab. Wildlife rehabilitation has actually caused divorces. Make sure that the people who are close to you in life are at least supportive. 
the best case is when you're a team and you both have the same passion. So one of the things that I always tell people when they are making a decision whether to become a wildlife rehabilitator or not is you need to have a real, real heart-to-heart -heart powwow with your immediate family. Health. If there's someone in your household who has severe health problems, especially immune problems, wildlife comes along with lots of nasty parasites and diseases that you better have one heck of an immune system to fight off. We actually faced a really hard decision last year. We had been rehabilitating wildlife for 20 years. Maury, my other half, who did the introduction, and he was diagnosed with esophageal cancer, stage four. He still has it. When he was diagnosed, we sat down and we're like, you're gonna be spending the next year in chemotherapy. You can't be exposed to anything. And he told me, he said, the one thing he does not want his health to affect is Red Creek and its goals and its mission. So we made the decision to be really careful. We had step pans that went from the wildlife area into his area. Volunteers were not allowed to go into the house. Our house is off limits. This is a decision you really have to think about personally. How healthy are you? So it is something that you definitely have to think about. Also time. Do you like all of a sudden deciding to go away to Atlantic City for the weekend? If you have a litter of animals that needs to be fed, and they have to be fed every two and a half hours, you have made a commitment until that animal is old enough to take care of itself. You've made a commitment that you are going to be available. You wanna keep these things in mind as you're making decisions. You may decide, I only wanna do baby raptors because they only have to be fed twice a day and they're only here from June and July they're self-feeding by August. These are the kind of things you can think about while you're making decisions, but time is really very important and we're gonna talk about that later. I'm gonna show you how time consuming it actually can get. Disenchantment. I groomed dogs for 30 years. That's how I supported Red Creek for 17. I love dogs. When you go to groom a dog, you better really love dogs. Because after about five years, you start not liking dogs so much anymore. <laughs> so you better have an awful lot of love left. You lose some of your passion. You lose some of your compassion. You lose some of that emotion. You better have an awful lot there. Because that's how people become cruel and neglectful, is by not having enough in the beginning. You become clinical. So make sure that you are passionate about enough. And that's one of the words I'll use over and over again is passionate about it enough that when you lose some of that love, you're not gonna become hateful and cruel and neglectful and nobody ever starts out being that way. There's one reason though why people quit and that's because of lack of information before they start is the people that became licensed and quit in two years had no idea what they were getting into and that's what I wanna try to make sure that does never happen to you. On Facebook, they came out with these really cool things. They're called Memes, M-E-M-E. -E. And it has a career, and it says, this is what my mom thinks I do, this is what my friends think I do, this is what, this, I did not make this. I did change a couple of the pictures, but somebody else made this, and it is so true. <laughs> Society thinks we are so white hat. Honest to God, they think we're St. Francis of Assisi. <laughs> I had a woman one time thought I healed her bird and I had power because it was stunned when she put it in the box. And when I opened up the box and took it out, it had shaken it off and it flew away. And I was a healer. People are a little strange. Friends, they think I'm playing with these big, cute, cuddly animals. Oh, you get to do fun and I bet you play with bear and they just think it's awesome. The government thinks I'm playing with the animals, humanizing them, rolling around and sleeping in bed with them. Not everybody thinks wildlife rehabilitation is the best thing in the world. There are many people, and most of them are ologists. They're biologists. They're, you know, they're usually one of the sciences. One of the sciences that cares more about the health of a species as a whole rather than an individual animal think we're interfering with wildlife. And we can talk about that because I have a completely different outlook on it. But there are people who will tell you 
Why are you saving that, that rabbit? You are now starving a fox. And they think we're interfering. And the thing is, you can become disenchanted very quickly when somebody just tells you what you're doing is all wrong. So you really have to know why you're doing it. Uh, my family, yeah, uh, Snow White, <laughs> I'm playing with things. Um, what I think I'm doing, I'm saving the world. You know, we are the world, we are the children. I think I'm saving everybody. What I'm actually doing usually is picking up shit. And I will warn you, I can get very crass during when I talk. Our goal today, I want you to leave here with a completely accurate picture of what wildlife rehabilitation really is like, what your life will become if you choose to go that path, and the truth behind it. We want to talk about what life is like after licensing. I want you to explore your own personality and your own lifestyle and make decisions that are right for you. Throughout this entire thing, ask yourself, is this right for me? Can I handle this? Be honest with yourself. And we're going to talk about different choices that you can make to make things right for you. How involved do you want to get? There are different levels of wildlife rehabilitation. And what species do you want to work with? Because you may love a certain species, but that species may not fit into your life. And we are going to talk about how to get started. You're going to leave here completely understanding how to get licensed and have the resources to do it. We're also going to talk about planning for financial success so you don't fail, how to avoid burnout, and really the pre-planning is how you avoid burnout. We're going to talk about the education that you need and where to get it. A lot of people don't get into wildlife rehabilitation because there is no education until now. This is the first year where there is education for wildlife rehabilitators in Pennsylvania, and that's because we've started this. Most people who have become wildlife rehabilitators, there are no college courses for this. You can't go to school and say, I want to learn to feed baby bunnies. Most of them learned from books and then worked with a rehabilitator enough to get some hands-on experience. You don't have to sit in the classroom classes to learn, but it can be helpful because you can actually see things demonstrated right in front of you and actually do it. We're going to go through what the application process is so you know and understand it and you can implement it. We're going to talk about the different levels of wildlife rehabilitation. If wildlife rehabilitation as a licensed rehabilitator is not for you, there are other levels that you can get involved. And we're going to talk about them and the requirements. There are licensed wildlife rehabilitators. There are also rehab assistants, and these are all from the Pennsylvania Game Commission regulations. There are also infant care sub-permittees where you can actually take animals home and care for them yourself. You are not licensed. You're working under another wildlife rehabilitator. We'll talk about that. There are capture and transport permittees, and you can volunteer for a wildlife center. What we're going to talk about for most of the class is what it's like to be a wildlife rehabilitator, how to become one, and how to make those choices. We are going to talk about the others later.